Last day, last day. I know. <laughs> can barely walk. I'm sorry, I'm going to scone. <laughs> I try to eat when I can during this week. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out this morning for this. This is a very special um, panel, both not just in terms of the um, content of what you're going to see, <clears throat> but also of this wonderful man who um, we gave our visionary award to uh, last night. And um, I'm going to bring him up right now, and then I'll compliment him some more up here. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Rick Pralinger. By now, in, in documentary movies, you've probably gotten used to the use of archival footage. In my film, it's critical, my films, because <clears throat> they, do a, they serve a dual role of providing sometimes some incredible humor and um, also a damning, sometimes, indictment of what's going on. And by looking to the past, um, you can get a much better explanation of the present and perhaps even ignite a discussion into the future. Um, <clears throat> I first met you in 1987, 88. Yeah, while well, you were working on Roger and me. Working on Roger and me. Yeah. And you were friends with Kevin Rafferty. Mm -hmm. And you had worked with him on his documentary, The Atomic Cafe. Is Tiny that correct? Bit. Very little. Very little. Yeah. When did when did you actually start your so archival work? So Kevin's brother Pierce, Pierce was working on a film called Heavy Petting for Norman Lear, and Norman Lear had loved Atomic Cafe, and he said, "Make me an Atomic Cafe about sex and romance." And so, so uh, these are the Heavy Petting were for those of you my age and older were all the scare films they showed us in sex ed class in <laughs> seventh and eighth <coughs> and ninth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, the films that warped us, right? It, what, what your favorite pieces of archival in that uh, movie would be? Oh God! Well, I mean, I love the safety films, really, about the retribution that happens to kids that behave badly. Because the great thing about safety films, as I'm sure you'll remember, is that the fulfillment is the accident. You know, you you watch the whole film and you wait for the accident to happen. It kind of subverts the message. But um, so I, I love those. I was doing research on that film, and that's when I began to collect because okay. I realized there was so much media in this country nobody cared about. And and when you say that, um, just so people understand that um, so much of the footage, whether it's films, whether it's industrials, whether it's our news footage, whatever, home movies. You know this if you have if you shot home movies before you don't you can't go buy an eight millimeter uh, movie projector and project those movies any longer. If you put them on VHS twenty years ago, that VHS tape may not look very good. So there's a we'll get into this a little bit. But there's a huge preservation issue that Rick and I are very concerned about, and we started a project here on the second year of the film festival of of um, using whatever money, if we had any money left over at the end of the festival, to help preserve films that, where there were no copies of them. And, th and it started with us because we wanted to show Hair, uh, the Milo Milos Forman film of the Broadway musical. And we discovered from the studio and from our looking around that there was not a single usable print of Hair anywhere in the United States. Hair is a seminal, cultural, iconic moment, right? And I just couldn't believe that there wasn't a print. Well, you know, the negative is just one of a million cans in the studio vaults. Millions. Of yeah, and, and these guys, they don't have the time to care about a specific object. Correct, right. And, um, and so the next one was Johnny Got His Gun. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought the Dal Dalton Trumbo's family here. And um, again, nothing. Um, we pieced something together from we found in Germany. Um, and then Lincoln Center called me um, at, 
they were having their 50th anniversary of their film festival a couple years ago, and they wanted to show a few of their you know biggest hits through the years, and Roger Me was one of those. And they called and they wanted a, a print of Roger Me, and I said, uh, well, you know, call Warner Brothers. You know, Warner Brothers will have it. Warner Brothers did not have a single. They were all pink. All the picture was all pink. It had faded. There's not a single usable print there or anywhere in the U.S. I couldn't believe that my film had literally vaporized. And that was like yesterday. And that was yesterday. And <clears throat> with all due respect to my own, you know, kind of weird ego, um, <laughs> if I were not me and I was describing the cultural impact of Roger and me, especially on the documentary art form, for it, for the film that kicked off the modern day documentary movement to be gone was just like, what about all those other documentaries? If this is going to happen to me, I mean, I've got the means and so does Warner Brothers. So anyways, uh, you have become one of our great advocates and, and people here in this country trying to preserve footage. Not necessarily films like Hair, but, you know, why don't you give them an example of, of the... And how, and how, I mean, we, well, you basically gave or sold your archives to the Library of Congress in 2002, right? My first great moment of legitimacy. This is my second. Oh, no. <laughs> um, no, so, yeah, I began to collect as a result of working on heavy petting. I, I was amazed that um, it was really kind of hard to find these educational and industrial films that had helped to make us what we were. And so I began to collect them. Um, and it turned out that film was being, we were shifting to video. It was that moment of media transition when things get lost, just like video is getting lost now as we move to digital. And so I could have all this material for paying the freight, sometimes paying off the people who were supposed to throw it away. So there were, you know, um, I started collecting industrials. There were trips to Detroit airport to hand people cash to convince them not to throw things away. Um, and, you know, we, actually were able to save a lot of culture. I maxed out 13 credit cards renting trucks and renting storage spaces because I just I needed to do this. And then, as you said, Michael, in um, 2002, our collection, which was 200,000 cans, was acquired by Library of Congress um, because they have the old um, atomic nuclear-hardened Federal Reserve Bank in the, ba in the, in the mountain in Culpeper, Virginia, and David Packard gave the money to turn it into a, a fancy AV facility. And, you know, they'll probably be around for a while, at least as long as the U.S. government is around. The Library of Congress will be around. So that seemed like a good thing. And after that, I decided to um, kind of pull back a little bit, and I got interested in collecting home movies. Because home movies, I mean, we can get into this a little bit later, but yep. they're a very special and wonderful animal. But one thing that, that you taught me, and now, um, <clears throat> and when I did it, I have to say, when, it, when Roger and me came out, I received a lot of criticism from the old guard of documentary filmmakers who didn't like the way that I was telling a story. First with humor, that was verboten, and then secondly with using archival footage instead of it being just serious news footage to make right. the point right. that Does I'm trying to make. Walter Cronkite <clears throat> disasters, World War II. <laughs> right, exactly. All that stuff. Yes. And so in, instead of that, um, the, um, uh, oh, I just, can I just, I just, sorry, this just popped in my head. Um, I don't use drugs. I'm just, but I'm going to sound like I do. Uh, the, uh, I think it was the last episode of Mad Men this season. Anybody watch Mad Men at all? No? Are you sick of people talking about Mad Men? <laughs> Sicker than you are of people talking about Breaking Bad? Let's talk about tw Twin Peaks then or something. I know. It's like, I know. Yeah, those Twin Peaks people just talked about Twin Peaks for a Incessantly. long time. Yeah. But what I wanted to say was, it was the episode was, was, took place on the week of the moon landing. And instead of using the same old tired thing of Neil Armstrong jumping down off the ladder, it's one small step for blah, blah, they, were, they used the raw footage of Walter Cronkite on CBS just before he comes down the ladder. And Walter's blabbing with another astronaut. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. They're not even paying attention. Armstrong is like coming down the ladder. <clears throat> and in fact, Armstrong gets on the moon and Walter and his guests, do you think really that with the technology today and, 
And then, and then you hear in the background, that's one small, and then uh, Walter goes, oh, wait a minute, here, oh, 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 he's, <laughs> and, and then, and then Armstrong finishes it, and then Walter goes to the guy, what did he say? And he's like, <laughs> and I think he said one step for, uh, <laughs> But it was like, I mean, and I remember watching it that night, but of course I'd forgotten this because my memory of it now is the, is the accepted and approved archival footage of the moon landing. This made it so much richer um, and, and funny, but, but then also just kind of um, <clears throat> sometimes in the moment, Zapruder would be probably the best right, right, example right. of this. In the moment, even though you know something big is going on, you really don't know how big until it starts to get con uh, contextualized by history, by other events, um, and by our own emotional thing. 9-11 is another good example right. of that. Uh, One of the things that's really great, I mean, it's a, it's a great story because it proves that when you, um, the memories of our events become totally wound up with what, you know, the way that we see them repeated over and over again. And if you can go back to the naked archives without all the music and without all the narration and just actually see the raw footage, you can re-experience that event completely differently as if it's for the first time. Um, I've been collecting, I have a little special project to collect home movies people shot off the TV as Armstrong stepped onto the moon. And you know, about a million people, <coughs> a million people shot that. Yeah. These movies are not rare, um, but it's so amazing. You know, what is around? What are people doing? Are they eating? Are they, are they telling the kids to shut up? What's going on? It's wonderful. They're telling, they're telling Walter Cronkite to shut up. <laughs> yeah, right. Or they're trying to get, be right. Well, he was just trying to get his act together about the hoax. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, I think this whole, uh, so everybody understands what we're talking about here and the importance of this and, and Rick's role in this in, in terms of um, our, and, and I think, and after Roger and me then, a lot of documentary filmmakers then, they didn't listen to the old school, boring castor oil documentary types and they started, you know, or the National Film Board of Canada, nature movies. I mean, documentaries were either propaganda before that, like don't have sex, um, <clears throat> don't drive recklessly, um, uh, obey your government, propaganda films from the Defense Department, right. nature movies. Right. right. And, um, and when it opened up like that, you know, um, when, you, when you talk about Roger and me opening up documentaries to new kind of narrative, new kind of storytelling, I mean, it's, it's a really important point because we have to do the same thing now, you know, as documentaries. And this is actually what's great about Traverse City because it's not all the cookie cutter documentaries that work the same way, but that's what's cool about archives, is that it kind of gives us an opportunity to reimagine at least the historical stuff from point zero. Yeah, I, the, um, I don't know how many of the documentaries you've seen here, but some of them, uh, there, there's two, at least two of them I'm thinking of that did something I've never seen a documentary do before. And, and one of them is a hybrid of, of fiction and nonfiction but it's really, the only fictional part is that they just use actors, but it's all the dialogue, the John Lennon uh, documentary is all the actual right, John Lennon right. dialogue. Um, and I said to them, and I said to these other filmmakers, uh, you know, you've done something really revolutionary here for the forum, I'm so proud of you. Do not expect to be admitted to the Academy for at least 20 years. Because, <laughs> I mean, they just, it's really hard to get them, act of killing, if anybody saw that last year, was another one of those films I'd never seen anybody do that. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting and refreshing to see that. Yeah, and the gatekeepers want something that has already succeeded. They want something predictable. Right. But I'm going to, you know, I mean, this is my rant. You know, I want to, part one, I want to make archives sexy and exciting. And part two, we've only begun to imagine what we can do with this material. We're at like year five or something. And well, give us an idea of what year 10 or 20 looks like. like when you do imagine it in your head, um, what do you see from this point on? So um, when we come to a theater and we gather together, uh, as we're doing today, and as we've been doing this festival, why do we have to see a movie in the same way that we've always seen it? Why couldn't we have a shared event that has some different qualities? Um, we're going to look at a little bit of the um, Detroit film today, or about half of it. And, you know, that's an attempt to get you talking, to get you to make the soundtrack for me to, um, 
to kind of uh, hold back from being, you know, the egocentric director with a solution to everything and say, I'm more interested in what the audience has to say than what I have to say. That's one thing, participatory. This is not a new idea. Um, think of the Elizabethan theater where, you know, we would be performing up here and you would be the groundlings throwing food at us and making very clear what you thought of what we were doing. Boxing match is the model, you know. Um, but just kind of tweak that experience. People want to be in a room experiencing something together. Do the lights have to go down? Do they have to be quiet? Does the lights have to go up? Do they leave and then that experience is over? Could we try to integrate um, art into life a little bit more? One thing that we do here, actually, speaking of the lights, um, once a month we have a, a screening at the state for young parents mm -hmm. who <clears throat> maybe they can't afford babysitters or whatever. And if anybody remembers, you know, when you, you first have kids, the first couple, three years are, you know, you don't see many movies. So you, here, bring the babies, bring the carriage, bring the bassinet, bring whatever. We're going to leave the lights up about halfway. We're not going to have it on very loud so the baby can sleep, but you'll be able to hear it. And it's, it's um, you know, for those who have used it, I think it's, it's still, I'm still trying to, you know, there's still things here I'm still trying to, nudge people into trying, and this is one of them, because, and the, and the experience is incredible, and you forget at 10 minutes after that the lights are up halfway, or, you know, uh -huh. that there's um, babies all over the place. That's so great. It reminds me of uh, San Francisco Grace Cathedral. They have the blessing of the animals every year, and people come with their pets to church, and the church is filled with, like, hundreds of cats and dogs and ferrets and I don't know what else, <laughs> turtles. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. I love your... your I, I love, see, here you are all these years later, and you're still trying to rethink and reimagine and what can we do with, with this form, and how can, we, how can we make it more accessible to people, too? I mean, this is what you've done. This is what, I mean, you'll see this today. We're going to show something that doesn't have, um, I would say, a beginning, a middle, or an end, or any no. of the... No, no arc. No, no arc. Um, but when I watched this, Rick, it was like, I mean, I feel like I've seen, I've looked at a lot of Detroit archival footage over the years, and, um, and, I, and I put a lot of it in Roger Mead, some of it was yours, some of it was actually from General Motors itself. Um, yeah, I think you ordered that, that in our name, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, we, we were your beard. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Can I, quick, can I just quickly tell this story? <laughs> Man... A man who was in charge, I think he was in charge of the archives in the GM building on Grand Boulevard, um, um, I guess heard or knew I was making the film. And he said, if you want to come in and look at our archives, I'll, I'll let you come in quietly. I'll sneak you in. And I went into the GM building, went to like the ninth floor, and I spent three days there um, going through everything that General Motors had. It was the most amazing thing, stuff that you know you or no one else had really seen, old, old right, stuff. Right, right. <clears throat> and, um, and he said, just mark, I sat at the steam back at the screen, and he said, just mark the ones, uh, the scenes you want, and I'll get you a copy. And there was still a film lab in Detroit, and I think yep. using your yeah. companies, yeah. we must have committed a felony by doing this. We completely no. stole this footage from General Motors, and I'm five floors underneath Roger Smith, and I'm in the middle of making the movie. I've been trying to get this guy, you know, for two years. I'm five four floors below him, hoping nobody recognizes me. I put on like a suit. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to see the evidence. <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, so um, uh, I mean, I've always had this attitude of by any means necessary. Uh, yeah, and it's public domain. You know, they've outsourced that archives now. You know, it's some, some company. It's, yeah, uh, now you can get it without breaking the law. Yeah, if they kept it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, um, so this footage that we're going to look at uh, from Detroit. Yeah. Is, um, I just kept, I looked at it and I thought, Wow. I, it really dawned on me very quickly. I've not seen anything kind of like this. In part, it's not just so much oh, if it's that street corner or that neighborhood or you're going, yeah, where is that? I've been there or whatever. Um, but it's also because the filmmakers, the people shooting their home movies and shooting Detroit through their eyes, not through the eyes of the way the General Motors PR department wanted it to be portrayed, not through the eyes of the national media, who've never gotten it right about Detroit and still don't get it right today. 
I loved what you, you said to me here uh, last night about, uh, and I'll just let you, you should say it, uh, about um, th this, this kind of um, uh, disaster porn that we now see in, on TV of Detroit, and Detroit in the apocalypse in Detroit. You know, and, and other than something that somebody shot in 1967, maybe it was after the riots, but in what you're going to see today, I'm sorry, we're not going to take you through all the dilapidated buildings and all the stuff that's crumbling or whatever, because, and I'll just let you take it from there, what your feeling is and wh where you grew up and how you feel about the, how this all dovetails with your feelings about the deindustrialization of the country. I was, um, I was in Detroit a few years ago to show an earlier version of this because I've done this four times and I kind of finally started to figure out what I was doing. And I was in the B&B in the &B at, at, at Ferry Street and talking to some people and somebody said, oh, you've brought a film, you ought to tell this uh, lady, she's from Detroit. And, and this woman brought me over and said, this man's brought a film about Detroit. And, I, and she said, what kind of film is it? And I said, well, it's historical. And she said, are there any ruins in it? And I said, I don't do ruins. And she said, oh, great. I'd love to hear more. You know, um, and uh, there's a, one of the things that's really important, I think, about documentaries when you're dealing with ordinary people's records is respect um, for, you might not agree with them, but you respect their achievement in saving that history and in making that affirmative act to shoot. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, so look, I've been doing these urban history things in San Francisco for eight years. It's really big. We get 2,000 people at Christmas time to see what I call Lost Landscapes of San Francisco. It's the new nutcracker. I'm not allowed to stop. It's, a, it's, a, it's gone to be a big problem. I'd, I'd love the community to take it over, but it's actually really hard to do that. But it's amazing in the discussions that come out of it. Um, uh, the Detroit thing was uh, an opportunity. The reason I'm, I'm not a Detroiter, I should make that very clear, um, I grew up in, in New Haven, Connecticut, which went through deindustrialization in the 60s and 70s. It was hit very hard. It became a, um, a, a city where the economy shifted from, um, well, it was a weapon city, you know, it was Winchester and Marlin firearms, but it shifted from that to uh, basically to crack. It was very tough for a while. It was a city where um, race relations deteriorated in the 1970s and uh, 60s and 70s and everybody was at each other's throats it's a little calmer now um, but because of that the, the history of Detroit's always been incredibly interesting to me and I started collecting this material and um, this is this film is not about it doesn't have an axe to grind what it's really uh, about is making my own version of a contribution to this discussion that's going on in Detroit now about what is the future of the city going to be. It's a complicated discussion. There's people with money and a lot of power, a lot of agency that are part of that discussion. There's people who've committed to that community and stayed because it was an important and special place. Um, and there's new Detroiters. Uh, sometimes the new Detroiters and the old Detroiters don't talk and I'm kind of conscious of that as well, and so this film is an attempt, you kind of said it uh, before, it's an intervention of the past into the present so as to help uh, inform the future. And, um, and How do you think, specifically, um, especially with the Detroit Project, um, and I'm not asking you, if, I don't expect you to have the answers, but in terms of the future, um, how can a project like this or a discussion that may form around things like this, um, you know, how can we, they, Whatever, um, you know, move this move this discussion forward. Because, I mean, I I live here in the state, so I I and I don't like the way the discussion is going. And I you know I constantly get called by the media to come on, and I I, I don't know when it's been years since I'll go on and talk about, you know, because they just want to they just want to Detroit. They've got they've got the narrative that they want. Got it pegged, yeah. Right. They've got the peg, and and that's it. And. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, let's get that Roger and me guy, or if there's a school shooting, I get the same thing. I don't go on and talk about these school right. shootings. You right. Know? Um, which is very interesting, thinking about this. Connecticut is our largest, uh, or has been, the uh, largest manufacturer of guns, and especially... Right, and around. weapons and missiles and submarines and... You <clears throat> and around it. Newtown, yeah. uh, there's a number of yeah. gun manufacturers, <laughs> and and the other group, there's the NRA, and then there's the, there's the pro-gun group that is essentially the... Uh, corporate business association of mm -hmm, the gun mm -hmm. companies. It, its national headquarters is based in Newtown, 
uh, Connecticut. Oh, right by Sandy Hook. Right, yeah, yeah. right down yeah. the road from Sandy yeah. Hook. And again, the narrative that was written about Sandy Hook, of course, I don't think it did. I just tell you this for the first time? Yeah. Why is that? I have a high school education. Aren't there people with the college educations with, who get paid hundreds, millions of thousands of dollars every year? They, they will not tell us the, even the simplest of things because it might trigger a, hmm, what is, maybe there's something else we need to consider here. And it's, it's it, 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 anyways, I just think this is, you do this so well, and um, I get, I'm sorry I get riled by this, but I just, uh, um, you really help, you've helped me and a lot of documentary filmmakers fill in or connect the dots or, you know, the, the things that aren't happening in the nightly news. And, um, and I, you just, I mean, the whole Gaza stuff this week is just amazing to watch this. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post headline was the best. Uh, uh, two Israeli soldiers killed was the big headline, and then the little subhead was Palestinian death toll at 700. <laughs> you know, it was like, wow. I don't want anybody dead, Israelis or Palestinians, mm -hmm. but man, oh man. You know, but that's our media. And um, anyways, I'm yakking on too long. What, so my question was, <laughs> without you having, you don't have to have the answers, but I'm just in terms of the future, of Detroit. I mean, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this, dealing with it there. You've been there. I think, you know, um, it's up for grabs. A lot of it has to do with externalities. It's really hard to predict the way the... It's, it, for one thing, a lot of the what's happening in Detroit right now is happening in isolation because the investment that's gone into Detroit, most of it is an international investment. People aren't building huge new manufacturing plants. People are speculating in real estate right now, from, from what I understand. So we don't yet, a lot of the economic activity is being generated locally, and I don't think we can tell yet what's really going to happen. They do say with climate change, it's good news for Detroit, because if it gets a little warmer, you know, in the winter. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't predict, but on the other hand, it's a tremendously interesting mix of people who um, uh, have a lot of energy, people who have incredible survival skills, uh, people whose, um, uh, whose experience over the last 20, 30 years puts them in a unique position to really build an amazing city, and I just, I hope we can leave it alone and give it some help, but not try to force it into into familiar channels also not turn it into a plantation uh, you know there was all this talk about uh, urban farming in Detroit and um, there was going to be big money going into Detroit that would uh, build big farms and there were people that were going to become farmer owners but there was also people that wanted to turn people into agricultural workers in their hometown and not give them an ownership stake. And of course, that's one of the huge issues about uh, wealth in America, you know, that um, not so many African Americans own property, have wealth, a lot of um, European Americans do. So we have a, it's a chance to start afresh. There is a, there are all sorts of utopian possibilities, but it's, it's, utopia is a lot of work. But I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm already, a, I'm, I'm way out of my, um, uh, you, this, is the, this is the country that elected an actor as president, so I guess it's logical that we would look to filmmakers for answers, but you, know, <laughs> you guys have the answers. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> the, um, by the way, the Chinese are buying up huge swaths of land in Detroit. Oh, are they really? Yeah. Okay, oh, there you yeah. Go. Well, you can get a house for 25 bucks, come on. Um, but no, they are, the Chinese have, are buying up large, large plots of Detroit, and, um, and they've moved in a couple of the large Chinese companies slash private government-owned mm. companies into Detroit that whose sole purpose is to um, buy the copper wiring that's being stolen wow. and stripped out of homes and mm -hmm. stores and mm -hmm. things. And then, because um, and, China doesn't have the, I don't know what the natural resource, whatever it is, right, they don't have right. copper in China, but I don't know what the problem is there, but the, um, get some copper, China. Um, but, uh, but essentially, by basing themselves there and paying very good money per pound for this copper, they have in, in de facto encouraged a lot of the, the stripping that's, uh, that's going on. Um, and, 
Um, again, that's not reported much in the media, but um, but 60 Minutes did do <clears throat> do a piece. Mm, so fascinating. But, yeah. Uh, why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Yeah. Uh, how, okay. How do you want to do this? Then we're not going to show the whole thing. We're gonna. Right. We're gonna show. So this film runs about. Uh, for 70 minutes, we're gonna look at 38 minutes of it. We're gonna look at the best parts. Um, you guys are the soundtrack. I'm gonna talk a little bit when I know about something, give you a little bit of background, but I want you to identify events, people, places that you recognize. I want you to dispute other people's IDs if you feel that they're wrong. I'd, I'd like you to comment. Um, uh, we're not in church, even though it's 10 on Sunday. So uh, please, you know, make this your show. And, um, Can I just ask, uh, yeah. actually, how, how many people here are grew up or are, are live in Michigan? Um, oh, wow. Okay. Well, there you go. And Detroiters? Uh, yeah. People identify as Detroiters? So, amazing. Great. Privileged to be here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm from Australia. Could you just give us a summary about what happened with the flooding of the Detroit? Because it might have understand what you're going to Oh, they're from Australia, and they don't understand what, what the problem is with... Why, you mean why Detroit is a big issue? You want me to? <laughs> we were, <clears throat> the audience is going, no, why did she ask that question? <laughs> oh, God, here he goes. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, don't feel oh. bad about that. You know, we, we don't know anything about Australia. <laughs> That's true. I, th I think, were you the women yesterday? You said I should come to Australia, and I said I will when they move it closer. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, huh? Oh, the, yes, thank you for that. It's very, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. The, the 22nd version of <clears throat> Detroit, <clears throat> Detroit and Flint are the hometowns, the found, basically the auto industry was founded in these two cities. Uh, General Motors was founded in Flint, uh, Ford in Dearborn, which is kind of a, not really a suburb, but a, a attachment to Detroit. And, um, um, and then Chrysler, I don't know where the hell they uh, came from, but um, <laughs> Highland Park, yeah. Or Hamtramck, yeah. Now let me explain Highland Park and Hamtramck to you. <laughs> Imagine you're in Sydney, but a piece of Perth is in a one square mile area of Sydney. That's both Hamtramck and Highland Park. But um, how's that, good? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, so as you know, the auto industry um, uh, in the United States um, made a number of big mistakes. Mainly, they just started building shitty cars, and people didn't buy them. And they started buying Japanese and German cars because they didn't want their car to fall apart in three years. And, um, and people work hard here for their money, you know, and, and they, just, they can't save very much. They don't like to have a personal relationship with Mr. Goodwrench, so... <clears throat> the Japanese and German cars, people start buying them in the U.S. And if you go to San Francisco or L.A. or whatever, you'd be, you can play a game of slug bug, of the first American car you see on the street. Um, and um, they also spent the well, large part of the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, building factories in Mexico, Brazil, third world countries uh, to move production uh, there. And the government, local governments in Michigan and in the, and the federal government gave them tax breaks. During the Reagan administration, there was the division in the Commerce Department set up specifically to help corporations like General Motors move uh, jobs to uh, Mexico and that. And they did it openly. It wasn't a big secret. It was, it was they rationalized that let us just send the part production there because that's too expensive to do here and that'll help create jobs here where of course we know now is all a bunch of hooey um so <clears throat> so basically detroit um which used to have a population of about two million people now has about seven hundred thousand um and and it's been left essentially to the poor and the city is bankrupt it's been taken over by the government the government has nullified the election of the mayor and the city council so they the people of detroit don't get to run their own town yeah i heard their mouths are like it's wide a open puppet, a puppet a puppet government it's installed pub, by yeah, republican actually, state leadership the republican governor um removed uh, the i mean the mayor's still there he goes to work every day but he's not allowed to do anything or sign a check or or whatever and uh they did the same thing in flint and a couple of other towns uh, inkster. Um, so, um, 
and and nobody comes. Don't businesses don't come to Detroit now. They don't. There's not you know there are no new investment or jobs or whatever. And um, when President Obama says that he um, um, he you know he killed Bin Laden, but he saved Detroit. He didn't save Detroit at all. Detroit has not been saved. He saved General Motors. That part's true. He didn't save Detroit. And there's been no effort, really, by the federal government to, to um, try and salvage this mess. Right now, as we sit here this weekend, um, the, the, the city, being run by the Republican governor now, uh, is, is in the process of shutting off the water of at least over 100,000 people because they haven't paid their water bill. Mouths are open again. Are you shocked that we have to pay for water, that there is a water bill, or you pay for water too? Okay. Can they ever shut your water off? Oh, they can. Well, why? Why are you surprised then that we're gonna we're gonna make it so that a hundred thousand people can't drink water? And in, in yeah, well, yeah, it's a whole other industry of uh, people, right? The, now, you can you can <clears throat> pay somebody to turn your water back on after the city has turned it off. It's like Lebanon, yeah. Right, where it really like is guerrilla utilities. And, and there are parts of. Uh, um, um, Detroit that are that look like a literally a war zone. I mean, just bombed out and and. Uh, but having said that, um, it is the town that we all grew up loving, being there. The streets were. It was just a, It was a middle class mecca. Yes. You didn't have to be wealthy to live in Flint or Detroit. Uh, most jobs were union jobs. That meant not just the auto worker, but the guy bagging your groceries mm -hmm. at Kroger. He had a union job, which meant he had health care, and he could send his kids to college. People own their homes. People own their own homes. People, many people, working class people, were able to buy cottages up north here mm -hmm. on lakes. Um, <clears throat> their kids, that generation, our generation, were the first ones that really went to college in mass. When college was, I don't know what your tuition was, but. I went to University of California. It was cheap once I got residency, 600 a year. 600 a year, yeah. That's, I think, about what I paid. Um, so we entered then the adult world, not in a debtor's prison. Boomer advantage. <laughs> yeah, at, but, but from middle-class homes, uh, right. Right. not wealthy homes. And now we had what only the wealthy had had for thousands, hundreds of years, which is an education. And we were more literate, and we could, you know, so... Um, that's the <laughs> that's the cliff notes uh, in a very kind of disjointed way of what happened, but it makes us all here very sad. A lot of the people are here because the real Detroit that they remember um, is is a, it, part of it is what made us all who we are actually and who we think we are. Right? I mean, it's it's uh, it's where the real Santa was on the 14th floor of Hudson's. Uh, yes. Am I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. All the other Santas were fake Santas, but the real Santa was at the downtown Hudson store. So, um, you know, and you drive from Flint to the Cinerama in Detroit on Grand Circus Park, and they these big movie palaces. The, they've reopened one of them in recent years, the Fox, but I'm talking 4,000-seat movie theater. Yeah, you'll see a few in, in this. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, you'll see yeah. the uh, Riviera. Yeah. But this was all. This is all because people were paid a wage, right. right? And they could then have a life, and they bought things with this wage. And when you buy things with your wage, the people who make those things get to have jobs too. And it's a nice cyclical effect. And I'm usually not the person trying to, you know, preach capitalism, but <laughs> I, I'll, I, at one time. Parts of the idea of capitalism were very, were very good, I think. Um, like, you know, the, the, if, if there's some competition, the consumer benefits mm -hmm. from that. If you have only one movie chain in town, you don't benefit from that. All right, I got a lesson. Now, listening yeah. to you, I've, I do have a, a moral, a lesson. <laughs> one thing to say, which is that when you look at this film, you're, we're going to start in a minute, and I, I imagine we'll, we'll stop, you know, 
mouthing off, but um, you know, you see this wonderful community, vibrant, filled with all kinds of people doing interesting things and living a, a pretty decent life for the most part. Um, but you also see that this was not a city that was built to last. You see many of the houses were built on spec. You know, it wasn't all um, uh, good construction. It was boom and bust cycle. It had a lot to do with the strength of that, you know, major industry in the town. And I guess if there's a lesson, it's that as we rebuild our cities, we just can't count on single industries, and we certainly can't count on trickle down. And we've got to build those, you know, build the, the mortar that ties everything together, allows us to survive ourselves. But, okay, let me just ask you this question. I mean, I know you're not the expert on this, but no. just you saying that makes me think, that is true, and we put all our eggs in one basket here in Michigan, and we've suffered as a result of that. But Pittsburgh had its eggs in a steel basket, and Western Mass had its eggs in a textile industry basket. And I've been to those places now. I remember what they, they look like Detroit. Mm -hmm. They don't look like Detroit now. It's, it's not that they've come back to their old way. But somehow, all these other places that just went down the drain found a way out of the drain. And we haven't. And I don't have the answer for what I'm saying. I'm just saying this is our frustration that we've not either figured it out or we've not demanded enough political action or whatever it is, but... Um, they were better at class collaboration and sitting down and figuring out how to remake those economies. Pittsburgh went into healthcare and education. Massachusetts, I don't know what they went into there. You know, leisure. Leisure, tourism. Uh, you know, artistic. pretty. Um, but this is why in California and San Francisco, everybody's fussing and pissed off right now because the disparity of wealth and the lack of agreement between the, you know, the, the tech billionaires and everybody else is so extreme. There's a feeling that we're putting all our eggs in one basket and that we're going to bust bad. Well, Silicon Valley had this story. Right. They've created their own private metropolitan bus system to pick up their employees, and they're using the city bus stops and the public can't get on these buses. It's only, it's there for... And you know, they're big buses. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you don't really feel it till you see how massive these buses are. These are like the kind of buses that, you know, uh, Ted Nugent would, would ride in, you know, between gigs. These are big. They take up a lot of room. And we had Ted Nugent. <laughs> I know, what, what gives? Old Ted Nugent. Yeah, old Ted Nugent. No, <laughs> no but it really... And I, they, some of these people have heard me say this before. What, what really drives us crazy here is that this is the state where Thomas Edison grew up in Port Huron, Michigan. Born in Ohio, but grew up in Port Huron. Uh, this is the state that gave everybody Henry Ford and, and put everybody on wheels. This is the state that invented breakfast in Battle Creek. You know, this is, this is the state of Barry Gordy. The music that we have given the rest of the world, I don't think you could find a, a more broad and intense and, and quanti quantity-wise uh, than southeastern Michigan in terms of, of all genre of music, whether it is Motown or the White Stripes or Eminem or Madonna or Iggy or Bob Seger and Ted Nugent or now the new Detroit, uh, what is it, Detroit Techno? Uh, yes, Kid Rock. I mean, no, no, he just got on the whole list. I mean, there's just... But all yeah. kinds yeah. of music. Yeah. Um, but even if it was just Motown, that would have been... It's incredible a flowering of creativity. Yes, and these were people, Barry Gordy and, and Ford and all, these are all people who either they grew up here, they were born here, they made it happen here, they, they built their businesses here, and we were going to, we, we do this walk of fame, we, for the, the like, famous people from Michigan who come here, actors and directors, you know, Coppola was born in Detroit, and, oh, really? yeah, Paul Schrader wrote Taxi right. Driver, was born right. in Grand Rapids, and so we, over the years, we've been, we're going to put this walk of fame on, uh, by the state. So we're like, oh, so who was born in Michigan? Who's from Michigan? It's a fascinating list to look at in Wikipedia. Uh, I'll just give you a short list of some names you might recognize. Um, <clears throat> for people from, who grew up here. Um, Larry Page. Yes, East Lansing. Google. Yes, mm -hmm. East Lansing, Michigan. Steve Ballmer, CEO of Microsoft, took over for, for Gates. Uh, Farmington Hills, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Hewlett of Hewlett and Packard, Detroit. Um, one of the co-creators of Photoshop, Ann Arbor. 
Um, I mean, you could look at this. I'm like, are you shit? You've got a brain drain problem here. There's a huge, yes, and none of that money got to back. happen here. Right. It happened out there down right. their street from the, with the private bus. And it's like we've suffered as a result of people that grew up here or they went to U of M or, or Michigan State or whatever and, and then left. And they left during the 80s, uh, most of the, other than Hewlett, they, must, they left during the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, and and we, are the, we are worse off as a result of it. But, it. but it does say to me that this state still produces some incredible uh, geniuses. And I'm worried that the young people in this state, we don't know who the next group of geniuses are, but um, they're certainly getting a piss poor education now because of the money that has been sucked from the schools. Um, somebody stopped me here at the festival the other day. They grew up here, they've been in Wyoming, Wyoming, for 10 years, teachers, starting pay, $46,000. Come back here, starting pay in the, in the district, $29,000. Gee, I wonder who's gonna get the better teachers? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, it just, it, ah, I gotta shut up, we gotta show this movie. Hey, I met, a, I met a geologist last night. I didn't realize they're drilling for oil in southeastern Michigan. There's oil under Detroit. There's oil, there's the largest salt mines, I think, at least in North America, if not the world. Um, and there's natural gas all under the state, which they can't wait to yeah, start right. contaminating our water right. uh, even more than they are. Yeah, that do. filled me with a little bit. Okay, um, so you wanna look at a, <laughs> Um, I'm going to pull this seat back. Yeah, I, th I think no, they put it so they can see. Uh, I think. What I want to see too. Why don't we? If it's 38 minutes, let's, we could go down and and, and sit amongst the. the yeah. Area. Well, this mic stretch. Oh, oh, do you want to talk? Yeah, you want to talk. I, to I'm going to talk. Oh, yeah. No, let's move. The, let's move into the side then. We'll turn it around. Yeah. Okay. All right. Everybody, ready for this? Uh, thank you for putting up with all our. So there's a, a little bit of uh, sound in this movie. It's from a film made in 1972 by the Detroit uh, Renaissance Partnership. And otherwise, I think everything's pretty silent. I want people to say, say whatever comes to mind. Really, this is free form here. That is, Australians, that's not true. We love the snow here. Okay, this is an audio part. Hold this, hold this for afterwards. City whose present climate, ideal location, and unique human resources guarantee ongoing growth and progress. So this is from a uh, this is a home movie made in 1947 uh, from one of the high rises in, in downtown, looking over at Windsor at the moment. Yeah, right, where's the casino? Look at all those happy Canadians across the river. <laughs> Werner's plant? There's 1947. Now you know, having been here, that's the real ginger ale, right? Which they no longer bring into San Francisco. I tried to buy some for a party and I can't get Werner's. I can't, I can't get, when I'm in New York, I can't get it. I have to Amazon it. <laughs> it sucks. Um, <laughs> know, beautiful like Guardian free. building. The Penobscot. Who, who bought that? The Quicken Loans guy? No, actually, we got our Chinese. The Chinese got it? Um, so there's one thing about this home movie that uh, speaks a bunch to me, and it is this. The people that shot this 
um, they weren't just shooting pretty flowers and fountains in the Grand Canyon. They actually took the camera to record the world around them. And when you shoot video, um, please take your camera to the gas station and the convenience store and the supermarket and record these phenomena that disappear. Your people will love you for it down the road. If you don't get arrested. Well, you know, tell them what you're doing. Uh, everybody's asking if we have the Edmund Fitzgerald, but not yet. Is that a cruise ship, Rick? Yeah, this is probably one of the Cleveland boats, maybe. Stay tuned. Fort Street uh, with Railway Express and the, and the Express and Mail cars and the railroad. About 1939. Yes, that's the hidden actor in this film, is Smoke. Not so hidden. Michigan Central Station, I believe. And on the right, we're going to see the advanced glove building. Who knows what business is there now? John King Books. Best bookstore in the world. Uh, used bookstore in the world. I heard. You know he has a house in San Francisco now. He lives part-time. So it's about 1937. <laughs> and in a moment, you're going to see what the family business is once they've quit clowning. Have some Cracker Jack. They own the gas station at uh, Maryland and Warren. So this is a 16 millimeter home movie, and back in that time, to buy and shoot and to um, develop an hour of 16 millimeter film cost 1,400 bucks in today's, today's equivalent. So you had to be wealthy. But in 1933, eight millimeter comes out, and that's when working people start to make home movies big time. And there's this flowering of uh, creativity. Yeah, but you know something? In those days, they had people with trash cans come twice a day to sweep the gutters out. Mail was delivered twice a day. Yeah, that's right. Anybody remember that? Now we get it at 4.30 p.m. Are we going to get to see Melky the Clown? Maybe next year. <laughs> and it's the early 70s. We're still in a gas station. Power salute. This is also 1947, it's uh, Pan of the Rouge. Yeah, you know, it was reasonably, yeah, this, this would have been uh, a commitment. Kodachrome. A spanking new General Motors building. It's Michael's in his suit coming out. 
1947, Thanksgiving Day. And you know, usually parades are the kiss of death for home movies, but these floats are so great. I, I had to put a few of them in. I love this one, pumping gas on the float. That's a Hudson, right? <laughs> there you go. So uh, 1955, um, this is one of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, post office sorting centers. We don't know exactly where, maybe Fort Street. And this is a postal worker shooting his or her buddies. First time I showed this in Detroit at uh, MOCAD, the audience was filled with postal workers who started shouting, save the post office. <laughs> I thought that was interactivity. Yes, that's right. Although my grandmother, <laughs> she sorted the mail on the night crew in, in New York. Is the good humor truck driver here, the guy that drove a truck in Detroit? I met him last night. Toasted almond, 15 cents. Do you know what year it is? Uh, you'd have to guess from the cars. I, I can't tell you exactly. Oh, yeah, okay, but I do know this is 1941, and it's in Hamtramck. It's Carol's Beauty Shop. And either this is a mind enhancement or it's child abuse, what's going on behind those doors. Um, <laughs> Hamtramck's collecting a lot of material for its historical museum and um, we've had the assistance of the mayor, Karen Majewski, who actually brought that town back out of receivership. And she's the only working archivist I know who um, holds political office. She's mayor of Hamtramck. I'm sure they are. Yeah, we need a Polish lip reader. <laughs> Branching out from my main arteries, you'll find miles and miles of tree-lined streets, symbolic of a people deeply rooted in the pride of home ownership.
That music is so ominous. You know, it's it's a it's White Room by Cream. Is it really? Yeah, oh. slightly repurposed. Wow. It's made by hippies, you know, in Detroit. Um, about 1929, that house is so classic. Whenever I see these kind of houses in home movies, I know where I am. A little bit of uh, getting rid of the dandelions. And we're still gardening in the 70s. Don't know exactly where this is, but it's kind of sweet material. A lot of um, the home movies that we find, I have friends who look for material for me in Detroit, and this actually came out of a basement in an abandoned building, so we don't have a clue about the family that shot it. But they shot their community. You can see um, the whole thing if you go to vimeo.com and, and look this up. You can watch the whole thing. You can download it. You can show it in your own neighborhood. You can also re-edit it if you like. How do you survive doing all this work for free? And well, you know, we I mean, sell. You're giving it away for free. Right. We sell stock footage to people that want the highest quality and want to pay for a contract. And, um, and uh, I. I mean, it's so I generous that you just make this available for the public. To yeah, no, we have 6,000 films online for free. But uh, I don't want to interrupt this kid. <laughs> <laughs> we believe that this is from a family named Moore, but we don't have any address or other info. So if any of you know any Moors that look like this. My people came directly from Ireland to Canada to Michigan. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> But I went run into an African American named Moore. I always like I always feel like I gotta apologize or something. Like none of my family had anything to do with anything a hundred and fifty years ago down where they were, you know, whoever those Moors were. Fuck 'em. This was shot by a man named William Warrell from uh, Chicago who came to Detroit to visit his relatives and he wasn't the greatest cameraman in the world, but this is the boulevard, nineteen forty one. And there's a bunch of other neat images here. I think it's West Grand because of that underpass, but maybe you guys know better. Okay. Whoa. Okay. And this is, um, yeah, this is 39 or 40, I think, Navin Field, later Briggs. Any baseball fans pick people out, maybe? There's an umpire in a trench coat, which I never knew about that custom. Oh, they're press, that's what they are, they're newsies.
you could do if you had time and money and patience and community connections, you could do a complete portrait of probably every block in Detroit and home movies. Um, somebody's life's project. It just didn't cross the street. Title nine. He sees a Chicago one because he says the loop. He thinks there's a loop in Detroit. <laughs> I think this is Grand River. Uh huh. Um, so 1951, it's the 250, 50th anniversary of Detroit, and um, a family uh, whose last name was Slaby, who were deep, compulsive documenters who shot hundreds of reels of, of home movies all around the city, um, came downtown. I bet it's a Sunday because there's not much traffic. But uh, the old city hall... Mr. Slaby worked for Ford. Uh, he was born in Canada, from what I can tell. There were three sons. I'm not sure that's the daughter. I think that may be a, an aunt. These uh, home movies turned up. Um, one of the Probably a niece or nephew sold to family films on eBay. Uh, and you know, a lot of times families get separated from their, their stuff. Hudson's uh, Street Windows. Two hundred fiftieth birthday cake for the city. Pretty natural. Is this all the same families? So yeah, yeah. I think that's where uh, Anatomy of a Murder had its Detroit premiere. So occasionally we stray outside the city limits, and I had to show the Beautiful town drive in. That's just a in the Redford Township, isn't it? Is that still there? The screen? No. It was huge, I remember it though. It was Uh-huh. Um, so this is the uh, uh, Cooley versus Northwestern football game, 1947. I don't know.
Oh, okay, 1947, it's the Monier School and the little safety patrol action. This uh, camera person loved uh, twins. And um, uh, shot art class. This guy on the right saw himself online and wrote me an email. Ray Harding, and I said, you want a DVD? He says, ah, that's okay. Um, so this particular film I actually bought on eBay, but most of my Detroit footage comes from people like you who lend me material that I can scan, um, or from people who look for stuff at uh, yard sales, estate sales, and so on. Come back for a take two. <laughs> We're going on a field trip. Anybody want to guess where, where we're going? Uh, there's snow on the ground, so keep that in mind. These are all good guesses. You're going to have to wonder, Brad. I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> you, think a, uh, you think there'd be a school field trip to some place they served sugar? With ice cream, yeah. Well, these are all great guesses. But somebody, somebody already said it. Yeah, yeah, we're having an encounter with great art. This is the uh, Korean War era, and they're uh, seeing off uh, servicemen. But he pointed out the Powers hamburger stand up there. <laughs> There's the Dearborn Detroit town line, and I think I don't need to tell you what this is. I've got a little project to collect as much footage as I can of the Michigan Central Station uh, in operation. Rick, do you know that Frida Kahlo arrived there? It, really? Uh-huh. news covered it in Detroit. Uh-huh. At the station. Oh, yeah, the basement action. <laughs> yeah, the Fago poster. They're not drinking Fago. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Fago plus, yeah.
Meanwhile, in the kitchen, women are doing all the work. The faded uh, color does not flatter the food. Beautiful Polaroid. Oh yeah, um, so uh, it's about 1951, and the Slabies are um, using their son to add a little drama to walk through the neighborhood. And you know, I, I told you this family documented everything around them and left us a great uh, body of work, but basically there they are shooting all the stores and the businesses in the neighborhood that mean something to them. And this is Grand River. Um, I don't know this neighborhood well at all. I bet some of you do. It's, um, you'll see some landmarks. Uh, but it's uh, up around the Riviera Theater, which will show up. Joy Road, yeah, okay. And many of these businesses are still around, but they're not there anymore. I hear the Fernwood Bar sign is still up. Sorry? Oh, is he really? Okay. Right, the annex was built to handle um, overflow. From the, there's web pages about all the great uh, old theaters of Detroit, but by this time it had already closed, but uh, not yet demolished. It's a real movie palace, like Michael was talking about. I often wonder what people would think if they knew that hundreds of people were sitting looking at their home movies, you know, uh, 60 years later. That would be a little hard to assimilate. Oh yeah, the Victory Theater is showing Japanese War Bride, a film that I think uh, 
It's probably probably good that it's dropped off the dropped out of history. Man in the saddle. And back we go up the steps. A little bit of uh, clean up, fix up activity in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, this is also the Slaby family, but it's 1959, 1960. They're leaving and so is everybody on the block. This is uh, white flight in action. Really? Amazing. So you see every every house is for sale. That was our family car because uh, my parents distrusted the big three, so they bought Ramblers. Um, but the Slabies, uh, Mr. Slaby worked at Ford, so I think he got a discount on his Edsel. <laughs> they moved up uh, north towards um, uh, near Oakman and Mendota before they left the city entirely. How many of you have been to Babla? Oh, okay. This is an experience I never got to share, but it clearly is uh, pretty deeply loved. Werner's Brewery again. Yes. We're just pulling out. I found quite a lot of footage of the boat ride out, but very little footage on the island itself. This is about 1946-47, brief snippet of a ride. And um, of course, Wyandotte Chemical, now BASF. You get the sense of, that we didn't uh, we didn't see factories as ugly. People right, like to yeah. take pictures of them in movies and prosperity, jobs. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as we uh, move to the future. I, I hear there's a couple, or there's an amphicar in Traverse City. Yes, 
Jay Leno does not have that car. Well, uh, no, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> and um, we begin to come to an end here with some more smoke, coal smoke, and um, the Ambassador Bridge at that point with no impending competition. <laughs> and uh, the freeway. And I think we've got one more clip here. Maybe not. Um, great. Thank you. How do we sum this all up? Michael, what do you think? Well, I just, uh, I'm so glad that you're doing this project and uh, that this is preserved for, I think what you, you know what you need actually is the soundtrack of people narrating it here because after we're all gone, people won't know a lot of what we just said in here. That's right. What those things I are. Know. I've been wrestling with that. The problem is how do you mic a couple hundred people so that you can really hear what they're saying? Um, Maybe do it in a studio or some work something out. Yeah. Subtitles. Yeah. That's these. Yes. Right. And you've learned some things, right? By yeah, no, I, I've learned a bunch this uh, weekend. Um, but I would also say, you know, there's, there's work that's supposed to be permanent and there's work that's supposed to be impermanent. And it just is about what happens with uh, people getting together in a place. And um, one of the things I've come to realize as an archivist is that it's folly to imagine that we can actually collect and save everything. And we've got to let that go. It's kind of classic existentialism, right? We do our best, but we can't do everything. And um, uh, there's a bit of, a, of hoarding with this, isn't there? It's uh, hoarding. Yeah, hoarders. You know what that is? Well, you know, hoarders. If, if you watch the reality TV show, it's pathologized. And yet, I actually think that a lot of those people you see who are hoarders, there's actually quite logical reasons why they're collecting things. This culture is tremendously disorienting. This world is very hard to live in. Um, you need strong armor, and I think a lot of people use their collections as anchor. So, you know, it might be, it might be a, a disability, but I think there's also something quite often very positive I agree, about well, it. I agree with that. I, my sisters and I were just, um, uh, we're selling our dad's house uh, downstate, and uh, so we were going through it after he passed away, and um, and boxes and boxes of stuff in the basement, in the attic, and we were, you know, so right, away we, oh, you know, oh my God, our parents were hoarders, and you know, we're just like, oh, this is, oh, why did they do this to us? And um, but by day three of going through it, oh my God, we were so grateful, yes, to them right. for what right. they kept, things we knew about our lives, about our great great grandparents, about. Um, about the simplest of things, or things that that I thought uh, I found my Eagle Scout badge I, or medal. I, I I thought I'd lost it. Uh, I found my class ring from high school that my girlfriend never gave back to me. How did my parents get it? Your parents got it. Your parents what? got it back. I got it back. How wow. did that happen? They defended you. Well, you know, um, you, this actually there's a point to to pull out of this, um, which is uh, don't rely on institutions to save history that's relevant to you. Archiving is now decentralized. In a sense, it's like the internet. We um, do your best to save what's important to you and you know, go online and figure out the, the tools and the right containers and the temperature and all that. But that's the only way history is going to be saved because there's too many of us now. And institutions aren't funded. 
to fill the gap in this country. And you know, this is how a lot of the important histories were saved. African American history was not saved by big institutions for the most part. It was saved by individual collectors, like this woman Mamie Clayton in LA, who um, was a librarian who collected uh, books, movies, personal documents, photographs that everybody else nobody cared about, and now it's a major, major archives, and many local historical societies, same thing, so you can do your part. When people, uh, just one, um, when people store things, um, I've heard it's best not to use those plastic bins, it's actually the old cardboard is, uh, is a better uh, storage thing in terms of what you said, like the, yeah. the leaching and the temperature and the... Yeah, acid. You, you don't can, want the light coming in right. through the plastic box, you know, the plastic right. bin. Dry, cool and dry. You can go online and, and, and read about all this stuff. We've got three or four minutes. If you'd anybody like to ask a question or make a comment. and uh, jump in right yes, here. Yes, right here, right in the front row. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Rick, I'm wondering if you have, uh, if there's archival footage of the Park Shelby Hotel and the um, Stedler Hotel. Um, I've seen the Statler. I haven't seen the Park Shelby, but, you know, give me a year or two and look around. And you might also ask the people at Wayne State. There's an amazing archives of film and photographs of Detroit. started out as the labor archives, but it's the whole city now as well. Um, over here in the front row. Yep, right there. Uh, I'm carrying around a couple uh, VHS cassettes that have stuff that that I love, that I'd love to have in a digital format, but uh, how do you do that? Um, there's, uh, there are a bunch of places locally that will do VHS for you. Uh, I would, um, uh, there are a lot of the, um, yeah, camera shops will tell you, Costco will, will do home movies and video. They'll send it out to a company in Georgia and um, they'll take very good care of your footage. The quality won't be great. Um, if I, I would suggest calling um, the AV department at the university and asking who they use, because uh, you can do it locally. It's not expensive. The camera shop might be helpful, so do that. Um, and you know, I should say that if anybody has uh, uh, home movies, especially of the Detroit area, um, if. I can, I will you know, make an offer to uh, digitize them and get you a beautiful digital copy in exchange for the ability to use it in shows like this, so, so, so let me know. Wow, that's a great offer. Uh, yes, ma'am, on the aisle right here. Do you have any interest in still photography? Because I have some that I can email to that. I'd, I'd love to know about it. I wish I did. I don't really have the ability or the, the smarts to deal with GM still. My father worked GM back oh, no kidding. in the 40s, and I've got some still stuff that I... You know. Wow, I'd love to talk. Okay. And right behind you there, the man. Um, looking at these, my uh, in-laws lived in the Detroit area yeah. in the 60s, and visiting them in the 60s from uh, the East Coast, I uh, was always feeling that the uh, sun never shined in Detroit, and I seeing this just reminded me that uh, the Clean Air Act didn't get yes. until later. My yes. father-in-law worked for the steel mills, and it was just always smoggy there. Yes. You're in the back center. Where are we at? Back center. Yep. Go ahead. Yes. Why did you choose Detroit? Um, I had collected film about Detroit for a long time because I'd begun collecting industrial films and spent a lot of time meeting with people in Detroit who, who had this material. And about four years ago, I was um, going to do a show in Columbus, and I thought I'd fly to Detroit and see friends. And I thought, wait a minute, I should do a historical program on Detroit. I've been collecting, and I, uh, through connections, I connected with MoCAD and. They said, well, we don't know. OCAD is what? The Museum of Contemporary Art in, in, um, uh, on, the, on Woodward, just south of the DIA. It's much more of a community museum. It's, um, they don't have a big collection. And they said, OK. And they put out 150 chairs, and we got 425 people. And you know, all the, I thought it was going to be hipsters, and it was old union people. It was the African American community. It was retirees. It was a very diverse and wonderful group, and I got hooked. And you know, it's just the whole my discovery, discovery of Detroit was just getting out of the car and talking to people and, and hearing what they had to say. And that sells you. Yeah, wow. Um, let's see, behind you there, yes. Uh -huh. 
Hi. Uh, just curious. Obviously, you're looking at historical stuff. Through what time period are you are you interested? In? Um, so, really good question. I I just do the film era, and it's because video is very hard to preserve. Um, film. You know, if you keep it cool and dry, it's good for hundreds of years. So I haven't gone much past the early 80s. It's not because I don't think it's important. Okay. It's just because I don't have the tools to deal with video. You also mentioned Vimeo. How would we search? Oh, yeah, yeah, Vimeo.com. Just search for Prelinger. I've got a bunch of things up there. But um, there's a Detroit film. There's some San Francisco stuff. And at Internet Archive, archive.org, Internet nonprofit, ever hear those two words together? Internet and nonprofit, technology and nonprofit. 6,500 films, including three previous Detroit programs and a whole lot of other footage free for you to use. We have uh, Vimeo, V I M E O. Yeah, Vimeo, yeah. Um, time for one more question. Who's got it? Here on the far left. Yep. Talk to him later. Oh, okay. We're, he's going to pass. Oh, okay. All right. Anybody else got the last question? Right down in the front row. What would you suggest for people who have, um, I have some video, but I also have reams of paper from my father-in-law who was a Detroit cop, and I've been preserving them, and nobody else in the family seems to care, and it seems someone should, attention should be paid. <laughs> Um, I can uh, refer you to some people who might be able to connect you to the people who would really care. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Wow. I can't thank you enough uh, for coming here. Uh, any final comments uh, you want to make? Uh, um, I've been charmed by Traverse City. You guys are incredibly welcoming to a degree that uh, goes well beyond cliche, and it's a wonderful festival, and, uh, you know, I hope you'll uh, go out and integrate history into your lives. And where's the, and where's the old footage from Traverse City? It must be well, people's you homes know, here. There's got to be tons. And uh, yeah, I showed okay. it. Yeah, at the yeah. State Theater. Yeah. Well, somebody should. But, I, do. but there, I'm thinking there's got to be more. Um, so of course, you know what it is. It's not. The, it's not dealing. It's the relationship management. That's the 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 real challenge. Somebody should do it if anybody's got the time and the interest. Well, thank then, you, Michael. Yeah, thank you so very much. So much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the last day.